Hi, welcome to LPC Online. I'm Pastor Doug and I wanna thank you for joining us today, especially those who are watching for the first time. If you'd like to connect with us, you can go to our website, listdualpc.com and leave us a message. We really hope that God uses this time to help you grow in your faith and be encouraged.
thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail. As thou hast been, now forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning. Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun. Stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great. Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Sings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see.
is frozen In the darkest night There's a light that shines There's a hope that's burning in shadows Like a seam of cold in a shattered world, there is one who holds it all together. If you're plagued by anxiety, if you fear for the future's unspoken. If you've nurtured your dreams from seed But the harvest has failed or been stolen In the darkest night He's a light that shines He's the hope that's burning in the shadow like a seam of gold in a shattered world He's the one who holds it all together In the darkest night He's the light that shines He's the hope that's burning in the shadow
one of the truths that has been, has been revealed and reinforced for me, especially during this COVID time, is that people are very protective and very possessive of their normal. Whatever their default in their comfort zone is, they want normal so bad. And normal has become this thing that we now are possessing and chasing after. In fact, there has been so much talk the last little while of getting things back to normal or even trying to establish a new normal that people all seem to be unified on the same page with the idea. We just don't know what that normal is. And I think that's one of the major questions that I'm trying to figure out and I'm processing and trying to work through is what is the new normal? What is normal period? And if we could go back to normal, would we really want to return to the way things were before COVID? Or would we want it to be even better? Like is a new normal a better goal? Is it a higher goal? Or should we actually try to bring things back to the way they were? Now, normalization is an interesting concept. It's an interesting thing that many of us have been talking about for a while. And I think a lot of us can relate because I've had a lot of conversations with people and they keep saying over and over again, I just want things to be normal. And so I want to know, can you relate to that? Is that something you've said or shared in a conversation already? And what do you believe normal is? What does that look like for you? Well, I was reading a a BBC article the other night and it frame things in a really interesting way. It expressed what normal was. It said our grasp of normal is an entanglement of objective and subjective, of moral and social judgments, prone to changing for the better and for the worse. This process of change is called normalization. Now, just as the article recommends and and suggests, it says normalization is a good thing and a bad thing. Some of the ways that normalization has benefited us as people and as a society is it has brought greater awareness and acceptance of people with disabilities. I mean, we have the Paralympics now. We have so many different things for enabling people to be able to strive to give their best, to compete, to experience the joy of life. That used to be seen as a complete write-off for a person. If you had a disability, you were considered to be less than and pushed away. Another way normalization has really benefited our world is it's brought further awareness and resources for people with learning disabilities. And I think all of the teachers can relate to this. It used to be back in the day that if you had a learning disability and didn't have the ability to process a lesson brought one way, one central general style, then you were considered to be not that intelligent or not able to function in the classroom. So you were pushed away. But now people are beginning to realize more and more there are so many different styles of learning, so many different personalities that come into play. People are created differently. And so, yeah, naturally they would learn differently. And that gives people the ability to process learning many different avenues and through different styles and different activities and engagement. And so that makes our classroom so much better and our teaching job so much more proficient and effective because now it's not just appealing to the 20% and all the other 80% are considered to be not intelligent, not successful. It's meeting people where they're at. A final one I wanna look at of how normalization has benefited us. We now have made major strides in gender equality and rights. It used to be back in the day that women were considered property, something that men owned. Now it's the fact that they're considered, their identity is, is more than just simply found in their sex. They're an individual who benefits society, who can have jobs, dreams, passions, and goals to pursue, and they can make an impact and a difference. Do I believe that we've actually reached that place of gender equality? No, I don't think we're there yet, but I believe we have made tremendous strides. But normalization also carries a significant danger, and this is the, the worst change part. And it's interesting how it can make things that used to be wrong, immoral, unhealthy, and just plain avoidable, appear normal and acceptable to society. Now, we as a society have many things that used to be considered unnormal and immoral that have just been accepted now widely as completely acceptable. And I think some of them are the most obvious things. Others are things we may not even recognize at the beginning. But one of the first ones that I draw my attention to are how normal it's become for people to have open relationships. 
or even have divorces and have marriages breaking apart because commitment now, which used to be seen as a good thing, a moral thing, a right thing, is now considered to be not necessary. And it's totally acceptable to have relationships and all the benefits that go with it with absolutely zero accountability and commitment, which to have a healthy relationship is a necessary ingredient. It's what we need to have. But I think the big question that I'm at today is, is the normalization of mental health a good thing, a bad thing, or is it a a mixture of both? And I think for me, the more I think about that, the more I begin to realize the normalization of mental health is actually both good and bad. It is something that's allowing the stigma to be reduced, which I think is a great thing. It's taking away a lot of that stigma that pushed people to the sides, made them feel less than, not worthy or valued, and just broken. So it's taking care of them so they know they still have worth and meaning and value. But I also believe normalization is making things dangerous because it's taking mental health and it's normalizing it. It's making it so people are accepting it as inevitable or something that is expected because we're all going to be dealing with a mental health issue now. It's a part of life. And I see that as dangerous. Do you? The reason why I find it dangerous is I believe God has a much better and bigger life for us. He has a life that's supposed to be full and our health is supposed to be complete. Now, why do I believe that? Well, as I was going through and doing some searching in the Bible, I discovered a couple key passages that really communicate this truth. One of them is coming from John 14, 27, where Jesus is talking to his disciples right before the cross, and he's trying to give them greater encouragement. He literally says, I am leaving you now with a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Now this gift, yes, Jesus was communicating to the original 12, the disciples that were his friends. But I don't believe this is just held to them. I believe this gift is supposed to be for all people who believe in Jesus and are following God. Now why do I believe that? Because Paul also repeats this teaching multiple times in his letters. But the most plain example I have of it is found in Philippians 4 verse 7. Paul says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. God intended us to have peace, true peace, a perfect peace. That's why he's giving it to us as a gift. And here's how Jesus and Paul are telling us this peace will be established, how it will be able to be a reality for us. It says the peace will come and work in our hearts and in our minds. And when it does that, it will act as a guard in our heart and our mind against all the things that try to bring us down, that start to break us down, that start to divide us and break us so we are incomplete, so we're not healthy anymore. And I think that this is vital so we can live the full life that God intended for us. He created us for and he's calling us to. Now this is a vital and important lesson for us. And there's a uniform theme that's coming through it. But in order for us to understand what this means and what it looks like, we just need God's help. Allowing him to give us better understanding of how this can be a reality for us too. So let's ask for God's help now. Let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your teaching. Thank you for the Bible that clearly tells us that you desire for us to have a good life, a full life, and you've wanted us to have absolute peace. Help us to know what that looks like and how we can also guard our hearts and our minds today, that we can be able to have ourselves truly protected by your peace so that we can be whole, we can be happy, and we can be able to be the best that you want us to be, that you're creating us to be and calling us to be. We pray for your help, Holy Spirit, as we look through the word. Give us understanding, give us revelation, and help us to know what this looks like in our world today. We ask for your help with this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I want to focus on the first of those topics. They, they mention two different things, both Jesus and Paul, the heart and the mind. And I want to talk to you about what is a healthy heart and how we can have a healthy heart. 
The passage that I wanted to focus on today is Proverbs 4. We're going to be looking at verses 20 all the way to 27. And I just want to read those out to you. Starting with verse 20. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to the whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet and stay on that safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Well, this is some of the wisdom that we learn in Proverbs. Solomon is fantastic at identifying some very wise truth. And one of the things he focused on in this passage, of course, is the heart. But before we get into that, I would love to just focus on the first part of this passage. The fact that Solomon is trying to identify how vital and important this is. He literally says in this passage, pay attention, listen carefully. Don't lose sight or track of what I'm telling you. Okay, Solomon, I get it. You really want people to hear these words. This is something we need to be aware of. Apparently, our hearts are this important. Apparently, it's something we need to be aware of. In verse 21 and 23, he draws attention specifically to the heart. He names the heart. And he vitally, he says even it's something that is so vital. It brings healing to the whole body. And it determines the course of our life. That's how he identifies the heart. Now, looking at that, I can understand why we need to think that way. Because it's important for us to realize, yes, the heart is vital. For anyone who's done basic anatomy and studied the human body, or has done any type of biology classes, you realize the heart as an organ is a vital and very important organ. In fact, it's the one that really determines if we're alive or not. If the heart stops beating, we would be identified by medical people and paramedics as being dead. They check a pulse to find out if someone is living because the heart pumps the blood to the rest of the body. The blood that is vital, that has the oxygen, the nutrients, and everything our body needs to stay moving and active and doing its role. Anytime an organ doesn't receive blood, it will die. So it is the vital battery almost of our entire life. It's a simple analogy, but it's a simple way to look at it. The heart being the battery that powers our whole body. Of course it brings healing to the whole body, because when something gets injured, it's the blood that's going to be pumped in with all the nutrients and antibodies it needs to fight anything and bring healing and restoration to our body. So yeah, I get what Solomon's saying. It makes sense that the heart would be so vital and important. But what's strange here is Solomon is saying, my words are important. My words need to penetrate your hearts. So how does a word penetrate into a heart? Isn't the organ already closed off and sealed? Don't we have a couple things blocking it, like our skin and our ribcage? How does that work? Solomon, this doesn't seem to make sense to me right away. And why do your words bring so much importance and value to an organ like the heart? Well, the more I did research on this, the more I discovered that the people that were writing, like Solomon in the Old Testament, referenced the heart often. But it wasn't talking about the physical heart, the organ that we have in our body. It was actually referring to the inside of a person, their core, the inner man, if you will, that determined what they have with thoughts feelings, desires, and their will. It's almost like the the internal compass of a person where they determine what they're going to do and how they're going to do it and where they draw the boundaries and the lines. It's the person's personality and characteristics that make them who they are and what they're doing in their life. And I thought that was really interesting because when we figure this out and determine what the inner man is and what the heart is referencing in this passage, We read this passage totally different. Solomon's wisdom, his godly wisdom, was able to bring necessary help 
to a person's heart. And it was forced to penetrate a person's heart and would bring life to them and greater health and healing to them because his wisdom allowed their thoughts, emotions, feelings, desires and goals, and their will to be in a right place. To be guided by the compass to know exactly how they should orient themselves. And we live in a world now where there are so many different influences and influencers that are trying to choose where your life aligns and which direction you're going to go. They try to control you. And this is where Solomon is saying, my words need to penetrate into that inner man, into your heart, so that you actually have the right answer and the truth and aren't influenced by everyone around you. And I think that's vital and important because in this case, when we understand a will and desires and goals, we realize, yes, the heart truly determines the course of a person's life. Because think about it. The emotions that we have dictate how we feel every day. If we feel good when we wake up in the morning, we're more likely going to have a great day because we don't allow every single thing to impact us in a negative way. We can see things with a different perspective for good. Our emotions are very important that way. Other than that, our our desires and our goals are vital because they literally chart out our path. We live our life according to what our goals are because they determine what we're aiming towards, what we're striving to, to reach. And if we have a good goal, we will be on a great path. And we'll have greater discipline to reach that goal because we're striving for something that's good and right. If we have different desires that are leading us in a not-so-healthy path, our life will not be walking down a direction that's healthy. It will determine the direction of our life. Plus, our will. Our will is a part of us. If we have a strong will, not a weak and broken will, but a strong will, we're ready to put the necessary time and effort into something. The discipline to accomplish that goal. And we won't just be pushed over by every circumstance change or attack of someone or hardship we face in life. If we have no will, anything will push us off our path. We will be so beaten down and battered easily. But if we have a strong will, we will be able to push through all of those hardships and distractions and difficulties. That is all from the inner man. And that's why I think Solomon is so strong to let us know this. We need to guard our heart above all else because our heart is truly what charters our course. It directs and guides our path in life. It will guide our whole life because our heart is where our will comes from. It's where our goals and our desires come from. And it's where our emotions and our feelings stem from. If we have those in a healthy place, we will be walking on a good path. And our life will be so much more full. Now Solomon doesn't just stop there, which he could have. Because that is enough for us to get the basic understanding. But then he goes on to reinforce again through repetition how vital and important it is for us to have that right path. In verse 25 to 27, he literally says, Look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Now, there is a lot of repetition in that, but there are also some specific things that we can draw from that as well. I think what we need to have the first part is look straight ahead. Focus. Focus is essential. We need to be fixing our eyes on a single target, a single destination, and what really matters in our life. And the circumstances that we're facing now as opposed to things that are either in our past or in our future Now, I think that's vital and important for us in two different ways. One, because there are so many opportunities for us to become divided. As an individual, our focus, our attention, our emotions, we can become easily divided. And the more divided we are, the less we are able to stand. To stand for what is right, to stand for what we're striving to do, to make a difference and an impact in our life. Many people get so caught up in obsessing over the past 
They are so consumed by what their history used to be, what was going on in those past days, what happened yesterday, the day before, last week, last year, that they are so consumed that they miss what's literally happening right in the present, what is happening right now, what they have potential to do. These people who are stuck in the past have lost out on opportunities over and over again because they continually are stuck in what happened yesterday. There are also other people that are so consumed with tomorrow or what's happening in the future and they become so filled with with either fear and anxiety or hope and dreams, but they live in tomorrow and they are not connected to the present, connected to right now in this moment and they miss out on what they're supposed to do, the necessary investment they need to make for tomorrow, the discipline they need to establish to succeed in the future. They are not able to succeed because they don't know yet what they need to do right now. They miss out on what's required of them in this moment for the days to come. And this is tying to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6 where he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't stress out and freak out and don't look backwards all the time. You need to focus on what is right in front of you. Focus on today because today has enough worries of it all on its own. It doesn't need anything else added to it from yesterday or tomorrow. Focus on today. But then he also starts to talk about how we are also called to be fixated on one thing. Look straight ahead. Don't become distracted. Don't constantly be looking around. Focus and fixate your attention on what is right ahead of you. And then he says, mark out a straight path to what you fixed your eyes on. I love how he says that. Mark out a straight path. Because this is all identifying how we're supposed to be singular in our focus. Focused on one thing. This means we can't have two masters. We're not supposed to be influenced by multiple different things. We're supposed to be influenced by a singular thing. One thing being our true master, our life being identified, our life being, or I would say, organized and and directed towards a singular task and purpose, a true mission that we live for. And Solomon is telling us that should be God. God should be the one who is our focus in all things. And he starts to address it. He's saying, listen, Yes, the heart is determined and it marks out a straight course if we have a singular destination. If we are distracted by multiple different things, the problem that we have and the struggle that we fall into is the same one that so many people have all throughout history. You become like the Israelites wandering in the wilderness Even though the promised land was not that far of a journey, they were stuck going in circles over and over and over again because they were so distracted by different things. And they were struggling with submitting to God. It kept being, well, yeah, God, we're following you, but now we're in rebellion because we want what we desire. Our own personal desires now have overpowered yours. We've given them greater authority. And so they kept walking a path that was crooked and windy. It was not straight. It was not moving towards a singular target. And because of this, they were not on a safe path. They fell into constant danger because their path that God had laid out for them was not what they were following. And so their their distractions, their deviations, their rebellion led them to places that were not healthy and safe. And oftentimes didn't bring victory. And these relates are just one example of this. There are so many examples in the Bible and all throughout our history as Christians of people who have fallen for this trap. They are not able to be fully submitted to God. They are constantly struggling with following God themselves, the world, other influencers that allows them to be a divided house. And that means their journey, which is supposed to be straight and safe, becomes messy and mixed up, and they are filled with so much exposure to danger that was not intended to be there. God didn't want to put it in their life, but they literally have walked into that. They did it themselves. And I think that we often make the mistake of assuming that any hardship and disappointment in our life, any any challenge we face, is actually God's fault. And many of us over-spiritualize it and say, oh God, you must be bringing a trial into my life, or a hardship. 
And it's true, God does that. But how many of those trials that we face are because we made the mistake of turning off God's path, of going off course, because we allowed something else to have authority in our life, to be a distraction to us, to divide our focus and our will, to divide our desires and our goals so they weren't all God's will and his desires and his goals. They weren't kingdom-oriented. They became caught up in the flesh and in our selfish nature. This is something that we need to understand because if we really fixate on God and on his word, on his presence, on his will, they will become our singular focus and our guiding compass. And we will be following one compass, not multiple compasses. We will have a straight path and it will be a safe path Does that mean that we're never going to face hardship and struggles? No, they will still come, but it will be the safe path because God's will and his purpose always succeeds. The things of God will always come to pass in his time, which means he has already won the ultimate victory. We already know that as believers, he has already won the war. So he will be leading us to ultimate victory. So if we follow God's path, it will lead to success. And that's why it's a safe path, even though it does come with challenges and hardships as well, but they're challenges and hardships that won't actually take us away from life in its fullness. It won't actually take us to a place where we become broken and and a person who has no value. And it won't distract us from reaching the end goal and destination, which is with Christ, which is fullness, which is eternal life, which is victory, ultimate victory. We will be able to reach those still. And that's exactly why Solomon is continually reinforcing this. He says, don't get sidetracked or distracted by anything other than God. Because every time you do that, we will be taken off course. And even if you have an amazing life, even if you are such a good Christian, if you are off your path by one degree, it's like a plane when they're on a journey or like a train or a ship if they're off by a singular degree, what happens is they will eventually become off course. And for planes and trains, they will end up, uh, or I should say for, for planes and ships, they will end up away from their destination, their goal, by hundreds or thousands of kilometers because their path continually brought them further and further away from God. And if you're a train, the more you are off kilter and off pace, you will eventually become derailed because you'll fall off the tracks, the tracks that God has laid out as a guide for us. We need to be focused on God. And this is where we are able to guard our hearts, guard our emotions and feelings, guard our goals and our desires, guard our will, because that's truly what our heart is. This is how we guard ourself from falling into the same trap of so many people where we allow mental health challenges to become a reality for us and a thing we embrace and accept. God says, no, I want you to have life with true peace, a peace that passes all understanding. I want you to be able to have a peace that will guard your heart so you will have only my will my desires and goals, and I will fill you with life and vitality so your emotions are filled with absolute joy. Even in hardship, you can have true joy. You can overcome all the things that would distract you from reaching what is truly the bright purpose, the goal I have for you, the full life, the good life that I want you and have created you to have and I'm calling you to right now. This is where I believe we can learn from what Solomon was teaching us, what Paul is sharing in his letters, what Jesus is teaching his disciples, this central theme of the Bible, in order for us to have that life, we need to be guarding our hearts and allowing God to be the one who rules in our heart. Then our heart would truly be filling us with the healing in our whole body, healing in our whole entity, our whole being, that he has the capacity to bring. Because God is the greatest of all healers. He can bring wholeness to us. He can bring value and worth. He can bring joy to us and the peace that allows us to rise above every difficulty. This is where we're able to have that full life that God is calling us to. 
when we have his true peace in our heart and in our heads. But for today, the big focus is our hearts. If you would say a word of prayer with me, let's ask for his help now as we strive to have him penetrating and filling our hearts and guarding us with his peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that you are good and you truly want to work in our lives. You have a purpose for us, a higher purpose, a greater purpose. Help us to realize the full life that you have for us and that we would be able to truly give everything we have to follow you, that we would be focused fully on you. We would be singular, only bowing and submitting to you. You would be the only master we have. And that that would be the one thing that allows us to become fixated on you, empowered and equipped by you in every way, so that we can be a true believer, a Christian who is filled with joy, fullness, strength, love, and all the things that you're calling us to be. And we would be able to do that no matter how life responds and circumstances change. We would be able to rise above all of them and keep our focus singular on you and continue to walk out the path that you've called us to, filled with your peace in the midst of the storm, filled with your strength and your love and your wholeness of healing, God, that allows us to be right, that allows us to be effective and allows us to live life to the fullest. We ask and we pray for this now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I have a benediction that I want to pray over you. And it's taken from Psalm 51, verse 10. It says, Father, may you create in all of us, all the people who are watching today, a pure and a healthy heart and renew a right spirit within us today. We ask that in Jesus' name so that we can live for him. Amen? Amen. Well, that is my prayer for all of us today. I pray that you have an amazing week, a week full of God, and that he would fill you with his peace and his right spirit. And I pray that you would use that peace to guard yourself in every way. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.